από τον πρόεδρο Μπούς. Από ό,τι φαίνεται η διαφορά του θα ξεπεράσει το 10%. Έχει ήδη εξασφαλίσει την νίκη στη πολιτεία του Ιλλινόης. Μετά, για πρώτη φορά μετά από 25 ολόκληρα χρόνια, δημοκρατικός υποψήφιος κερδίζει αυτή τη πολιτεία. Με 22 εκλέκτορες. Έχει το Μίσιγκαν, το Μέιν, Μασατσούσετς, Νιου Τζέρσι, Νιου Χάμψαε και την Πενσιλβάνια με 23 εκλέκτορες. Οπότε αυτή την ώρα θεωρείται σίγουρο νικητή. Και πες μου πάλι, σε παρακαλώ, τι γίνεται, πανηγυρίζει, είσαι μέσα στο αρχηγείο του Μπιλ Κλίντον. Έχουμε... Πες μου τι γίνεται, ο Μπιλ Κλίντον έχει εμφανιστεί. Ο Μπιλ Κλίντον όχι ακόμα, περιμένουμε σε μία έως δύο ώρες από τώρα να βγει και να εκφωνήσει τον νικητήριο λόγο του, αλλά όλη η πόλη είναι στους δρόμους, πανηγυρίζει ξέφρενα και περιμένουμε ακόμα. Περιμένουμε. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ την Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ την Κέλλη Βούρβουλη. Ξέρουμε ότι θα είναι συνέχεια όλο το βράδυ και μέχρι τα ξημερώματα, μέχρι τις 10 το πρωί ε, κοντά μας. Ε, θα επιστρέψουμε τώρα πάλι στο ρεπορτάζ, στο, στη συνέντευξη του Dan Quayle. Ξέρετε, ήταν σημαντικό ότι όλοι γνωρίζει όλοι άλλοι. Και... Ήταν πολύ segregated like all southern towns were then. And I remember my grandmother and grandfather opposing the closing of Central High School to keep black students out. They were far integrating the schools. It was interesting, my, I mean, my grandfather had a great school education. And my grandmother had graduated from high school from a tiny little school out in Bodcar, Arkansas. His grandmother just valued education above all else. I mean, from the time Bill was in a high chair. She had, um, you know, like playing cards tacked up on the drapes in the kitchen area where she fed Bill, and she would tell him what the numbers were, and she would read to him all the time so that, you know, he was able to read at a really young age in part because his grandmother valued it so much and, and helped him so much. They didn't go around and see the world and become broad-minded. They did it out of the depth of their experience and their, and their heart. And I was always really proud of them. On August the 18th, 1946, I walked to the Malco Theater in downtown Hope to see a picture called Tomorrow is Forever. And it must have been prophetic because the next day, Bill was born. You know, when you lose your husband, you never, ever think you're going to get married again. Never. And I kept looking at this child and didn't feel that I was going to be able to earn enough money. She went back to New Orleans to finish her nursing education. She became a nurse anesthetist. And it was, you know, tough for her to leave me. And during this time she was away, one time my grandmother and I went down on a train to visit her. I remember we pulled out of the station and my mother kneeled at the side of the track and cried because she felt so bad that I was leaving. It's one of my most vivid memories of childhood. Some people think that Bill must have been born wealthy and raised wealthy, you know, that uh, he had all of the privileges that you could ever imagine. Well, you know, instead of being born with a silver spoon in his mouth, he was really born into a house that had an outhouse in the backyard. My, my stepfather, as you know, we had some problems growing up, but he was very good to me. Roger Clinton was an alcoholic, a good man, and if he ever loved anything in this world, it was Bill. When I was in the ninth grade, I think he was, um, he kind of got, he got violent with my mother one night, and I just blew through the door and told him he wasn't going to do that anymore. I just said, stand up, I have something to say to you. And obviously he couldn't stand up. And so he got in his face and he said, Daddy, if you're not able to stand up, I'll help you. You must stand to hear what I have to say. And some way or other, he stood. And Bill told him then, don't you ever, ever lay your hand on my mother again. I never stopped loving my stepfather, thinking he was a really good person. And later on, I wish I'd known more about human psychology as a child than I than I did because I came to realize that he was a good person and that the problem was not that he didn't love my mother or me or my brother. The problem was that he didn't think enough of himself. My brother took over the leadership role in our family when he was just a kid. In old pictures, it seems like he always had his arm around me. When I was first starting school at the age of five or six, he went down to the courthouse and had his last name changed to the same as mine. 
You know, I have to smile when I hear my brother say in the campaign that we have to be one country because that's the way he's always felt about our family. Religion was, was really important and church going was really important to uh, the two of us. He loved singing the hymns and, and the gospel music and uh, even to this day it's, a, it's an extremely significant part of his life. Bill was always interested in current events. One morning, he couldn't have been more than seven years old, he read where Arkansas was on the bottom in education. He remarked to me at the time, Did you know if Arkansas will let me, one of these days I'm going to get us off the bottom? Well, you know, you don't pay a lot of attention to a child saying something like that. It was in, in July of 1963 that I went to Washington and met President Kennedy at the Boys Nation program. And he came out and, you know, made a few little comments. We were all standing there in alphabetical order, so Arkansas was near the front of the line. And I was the biggest kid there. And so I made sure that I got to shake hands with him. And I remember just uh, thinking what an incredible country this was, that somebody like me who came from a little town in Arkansas who, you know, had no money, no political position or anything, would be given the opportunity to meet the president. When he came home from Boyce Nation with this picture of John Kennedy and himself shaking hands, I've never seen such an expression on a man's face in my life. He just had such pride. And I knew then that government, in some form, would be his goal. I was raised in a, in a time when mothers would say they hoped their children would grow up to be president. I was raised to believe in this country, to believe in this system, to believe that uh, elections were good things that gave people a chance to have their say and change the course of events. One of my earliest memories is of my brother reciting Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech by heart from beginning to end. greatest political speech of my lifetime. It was so powerful, it was so true, it was so moving, it was such a wake-up call for the country. I was heartbroken when Martin Luther King died. Washington burned, I was in school there then, I drove supplies down into the burned out part of the cities. It was a terrible time and it just broke the hearts and, and spirits of millions of people. It was only two months later uh, Robert Kennedy was killed. You know, those two deaths, they changed a lot of things for my generation, for this country. And if both of them had lived, I think the last 20 years would have been a lot different for America and much better. The first time I ever saw Bill Clinton, he was standing in the um, hallway outside the law library at Yale, which is this wonderful Gothic structure. And he was surrounded by all of these fellow classmates who were trying to convince him to be on the Yale Law Journal. I said, look, I'm going home to Arkansas, and I don't, I'm not going to get a big Wall Street job. I'm not going to go clerk on the Supreme Court. I'm going home and be a country lawyer. I don't know if I want to be on the Law Journal. And he was listening politely, but he was watching me because I was watching him because I was in the law library at this long table studying. And I finally thought this is, you know, kind of silly. And finally, she just put down the book she was reading and walked the entire length of the law library and walked up to me and she said, If you're going to keep looking at me and I'm going to keep looking back, we at least ought to know each other. And I'm Hillary Rodham. And what's your name? Well, I couldn't remember my name. I mean, I thought that... Um, he was great looking and he was fun and he was um, just somebody who challenged and made you happy all the time. Um, yeah, I've just never met anybody like Bill. She came to Arkansas and we were driving around one day together and we, we drove past this beautiful old house and she talked about what a pretty house it was. There was a for sale sign in front of it. And I remember she went away somewhere and I picked her up at the airport and I drove her back and I said, you know, I bought that house you liked. She said, what? I said, that house you like, I bought it. So you better marry me because I can't live in this big house by myself. And that's when she finally said yes. I think they deeply love and are committed to one another. And then they have the kind of, I don't know, what I like to call synergy. I mean, there's, you know, the combination of the two of you makes a third element that is just irresistible as far as I can see. Bill's becoming a father and having Chelsea was one of the, you know, really great experiences of his life because 
It was something his own father never got to do, you know, never got to see his own child. I was there when Chelsea was born, and uh, it was still, I guess, the most incredible thing I've ever been through. You know, I just, I still remember how squinched up she was when she came out. I still love. Uh, how profoundly grateful I was that, you know, Hillary was okay and that I had lived to see it. I mean, I was very aware at that moment that that's something that my father hadn't done. He would just sit for hours and look at his daughter, you know, trying to take in this miracle. But then he would do things that just would knock me out. I mean, I remember one day when Chelsea was like three months old, she was learning to roll over. And I was in another room, and he was watching her on the bed in our bedroom. And he yells at me, tells me to come in quick. And he says, look at this. And I thought he was going to tell me she was rolling over, which, of course, I knew, which I thought was sweet of him. But no, he was going to tell me, look, she, look at this. She rolls over the edge of the bed, and then she rolls back. She must understand gravity. <laughs> and I said, all right. You know, and about 20 minutes later, I hear this plunk as my daughter unlearns gravity, right? Sometimes my dad, to make me laugh, makes like funny faces or he'll make funny sounds. And when I was little, when I would squeeze his nose, he would talk in a really weird voice. Whenever I play softball, he does sometimes embarrass me by jumping up and yelling and waving his hands. And sometimes he'll come over and talk to me during the game, but that's okay. What I would like America to know about my mother and father is that they're great people and they're great parents. Um, they taught me that I had to think for myself and they taught me to treat other people how you would want to be treated and follow the golden rule. Once early in the, in the campaign when I'd been beat up a lot by the press and Hillary and I went on national television and, and basically acknowledged that we'd had some problems in our marriage and we were proud of the fact that we'd been able to keep it together. Uh, when the show aired, Chelsea wanted to watch it, so the three of us went upstairs and sat down and watched it together. It was pretty painful, you know, to have your child watch that. And uh, after it was over, I looked at her and I said, um, what do you think? And she said, I think I'm glad you're my parents. After that, I knew whatever happened, it'd be all right. When the history of this campaign is written, they may say, well, Bill Clinton took a lot of hits in this campaign. But I want you to know some hits that I took in this election. Nothing compared to the hits that the people of this state and this country are taking every day of their lives under this administration. We no longer can have a country where I worry about me, you worry about you, they worry about them. That's the kind of country the Republicans have given us for more than a decade. We've got to be one country again, going up or down, together again. Sometimes, late at night on the campaign plane, I'll look out the window and think how far I am from that little town in Arkansas. And yet in many ways, I know that all I am or ever will be came from there. A place and a time when nobody locked their doors at night Everybody showed up for a parade on Main Street, and kids like me could dream of being part of something bigger than themselves. I guess there'll always be a sadness in me that I never heard the sound of my father's voice or felt his hand around mine. But all of us have sadness and disappointment in our lives, and hopefully we grow stronger for it. I know every day that I'm alive, I hope I'm a better person than the day before. I hope that every day from this day forward, we can be a nation coming together instead of coming apart. And I hope that we as a people will always acknowledge that each child in our country is as important as our own. I still believe these things are possible. I still believe in the promise of America. And I still believe in a place called hope. Συγγνώμη για την φράση που θα χρησιμοποιήσω, εκπληκτικότερα προφίλ που έχω δει σε μια προεκλογική εκστρατεία είναι το προφίλ το οποίο ετοιμάστηκε από το Δημοκρατικό Κόμμα, ειδικά για αυτή την προεκλογική εκστρατεία, δείγμα πραγματικής δουλειάς τηλεοπτικής και φαντάζομαι ότι αυτό εδώ το το ταινιάκι των 14 λεπτών πρέπει να έπαιξε ένα πολύ σημαντικό παράγοντα γιατί άγγιξε πολλές α, ψυχές α, των, των ανθρώπων. Ε, δείγμα γραφής, α, ο Μπίλ Κλίντον... Α, 
οποίο πιστεύω ότι και στην ελληνική κοινή γνώμη, Γιάννη, θα πρέπει να κέρδισε. Για όσου τουλάχιστον είδαν αυτή την ταινία. Έβαλε είναι γενικότερα πο... πολύ αγαπητό. Πολλά ανθρώπινα, πολλά ναι. ανθρώπινα στοιχεία. Και είδαμε και άτομα τα οποία θα τα μάθουν του επόμενου μήνε. Τη γυναίκα από τη Χίλαρη, την κόρη του, τη Τζέλση. Με το φω που πέφτει πάνω στου προέδρου των ΗΠΑ. Θα του δούμε πολλέ φορέ πια μπροστά μα αυτά τα ονόματα ε, και αυτά τα πρόσωπα. Πρέπει από το μικρόφωνο να ευχαριστήσουμε το κόμμα των Δημοκρατικών που είχε την καλοσύνη να δώσει αυτή την ταινία αποκλειστικά στον αντένα και να την προβάλλουμε αυτή τη στιγμή που πλέον ο Μπιλ Κλίντον θεωρείται σαν ο αντιαφυσβήτητος νέος πρόεδρος των ΗΠΑ. Τεσσαρακοστός δεύτερος στη σειρά. Μου επιτρέψεις να σταθώ και σε κάτι Άκαιρο. προσωπικό. Άκουσα κάτι που είπε και το ζήλεψα. Άκουσα ότι παραβρέθηκε στην γέννηση της κόρης του, ήταν μέσα στο χειρουργείο στη γέννηση της κόρης του και ότι ήταν το εκπληκτικότερο γεγονός που έζησε. Αγία το λέω, διότι σε λίγους μήνες θα γίνω ξανά μπαμπάς. Και οι πληροφορίε είναι ότι το μευτήριο θα μου απαγορεύσει να ζήσω και εγώ αυτή την, σκηνή, αυτή την εκπληκτική στιγμή. Α, απαγορεύει του πατεράδε να βρίσκονται δίπλα στι μονάδε να ζουν αυτή τη σκηνή. Και απλά έτσι. Πρόεδρο ενδεχομένω μετά. Σε ευχαριστώ που, που έσπασε λίγο αυτό το, έτσι, το συναισθηματικό μου, αυτό που με πιάνει κάθε τόσο. Λοιπόν, Γιάννη, μετά να πάμε στα αποτελέσματα. Ναι. Ναι. Ε, Ειδήσει είναι ότι η South Carolina την παίρνει ο Μπού, είναι οριστικό. Το κεντάκι το παίρνει ο Κλίντον. Είναι οριστικό να σα υπενθυμίσω ότι το κεντάκι το είχε πάρει ο Μπού το 88 με 56% των ψήφων. Αυτή τη στιγμή που μιλάμε. Οι μεγάλοι εκλέκτορες κατανέμονται ως εξής, 158 κλίντων, 20 μπους, δηλαδή η διαφορά αυξάνει όλο και περισσότερο σε επίπεδο μεγάλων εκλεκτόρων. Και έχουμε νέα σύνδεση με τις Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες, με τον Νικόλα Βαφιάδη, ο οποίος βρίσκεται στο Χιούστον στο του Τέξας, στα μέρη του Προέδρου μέχρι πριν από λίγο μπους. Νικόλα, καλησπέρα από την Αθήνα και πάλι. Γεια σα, εδώ από το Χιούστον. Εδώ το κλίμα πλέον το επικρατήσει. Το πάρτι που είχαν οργανώσει οι Ρεπουμπλικάνοι, υπάρχει μια κατήφια γενική. Είναι λογικό αφού ήδη 15 πολιτείε έχει κερδίσει ο Κλίντον και μόνο δύο ο κ. Μπού. Να επαναλάβουμε στα γρήγορα ορισμένε από τι πολιτείε που κερδίζει ο κ. Κλίντον είναι το Ιλινόι, το Κονέκτικατ, το Μπέιν, το Μίσιγκαν, το Ουάσιγκτον DC, το Νιου Τζέρσεϊ, το Μισούρι, το Μέριλαντ. Η Μασαχουσέτη βέβαια που παραδοσιακά ψηφίζει δημοκρατικού. Βεβαίω ο πρόεδρο Μπούσο έχει εξασφαλίσει την, όπω ακούσαμε πριν από λίγο, την Νότια Καρολίνα και την Ινδιάνα. Και η Βιρτζίνια φαίνεται να πηγαίνει προ την πλευρά του Μπούσο. Εκείνε οι πολιτείε που παίζονται ακόμη είναι το Τέξα, η Βόρεια Ντακότα, η Αλαμπάμα, το Ντελαουέρ, το Κάνσα, η Φλόριντα βέβαια που ίσω θα αργήσει να ξεκαθαρίσει η κατάσταση λόγω τη μικρή, πολύ μικρή διαφορά των ψήφων. Το Μισισιπί, το Οχάιο, το Τένεσί. Βλέπουμε δηλαδή ότι πλέον ο πρόεδρος Μπούς θα κληθεί θα, για να μπορούσε να έχει μια κάποια αξιοπρεπία στο πούμε εμφάνιση θα πρέπει να κερδίσει πολλές από τις πολιτείες που παίζονται ώστε να έχει απλώς μια αξιοπρεπή εμφάνιση διότι το παιχνίδι πλέον έχει κρυθεί. Α, από, τους, από τους εκλέκτορες πλέον, ο πλέον των εκλεκτόρων, ο κ. Κλίντον για να εξασφαλίσει την... Την εκλογή του χρειάζεται άλλου 112 εκλέκτορε ουσιαστικά από την κατάσταση όπω έχει μέχρι τώρα. Α, και αν σκεφτούμε ότι 54 θα του δώσει οπωσδήποτε η, η Καλιφόρνια, η οποία είναι καθαρά δημοκρατική πλέον πολιτεία, καταλαβαίνουμε ότι βρίσκεται πολύ πολύ κοντά στην εκλογή του. Φυσικά δεν αναμένουμε να, υπάρξουν, να υπάρξει η επινή και ομιλία του, του κ. Κλίντον πριν από, την, πριν από την ανακοίνωση των αποτελεσμάτων που θα του εξασφαλίζουν πλέον τον αριθμό των εκλεκτών που χρειάζεται. Και οι πληροφορίε μα εδώ, στο Χίλστον του Τέχρα, είναι ότι ο κύριο Μπού θα έρθει γύρω στι 10.30 τοπική ώρα, δηλαδή περίπου στι 6.30 ώρα Ελλάδα το πρωί, για να κάνει αυτό που είπαμε, concession speech. Θα, θα, θα έρθει εδώ στο ξενοδοχείο Western Galleria, όπου έχει στηθεί, είχε στηθεί και το πάρτι αυτό, αλλά και η σκηνή για τον πρώτο Μπού. Ξέρετε, όταν έφυγα την πρώτη μου και έκανε όλα τα κάνα. Commitments you make in life to, to basically give yourself over to other people and to work with other people and to do things. Uh, I think those were difficult for me because I was by nature a very solitary and self-reliant and self-contained child. So that's a big step. That's a big step. You were mentioning four days to go, um, and the latest polls today, one of them is 41:39 and one's 41:40. So they're closer, but you're still in the lead. Therefore, how can you be, uh, as you said yesterday? an underdog when you've been in the lead for so long. Admittedly, the lead shortened, but can the leader in a opinion poll be an underdog? Oh, I think so. And it, How? How? Because, first of all, I'm trying to defeat an incumbent president, which is difficult. Secondly, I'm trying to defeat the incumbent president on a platform of real change in the way 
the government works in this country, uh, different from what either party has done before. So I'm asking the American people not to embrace trickle-down economics, not to embrace tax and spend economics, but to go beyond that. Um, thirdly, it's, it's always difficult for people to imagine that someone they met recently, and they did meet me recently, um, could be someone who would both challenge and change the country and someone who would care for the country. I think we want both from a president. Uh, so I have always been the psychological underdog in this race. I knew that from the beginning. Uh, and I've worked hard and I'm continuing to press. I have decided to run a flat out offensive, aggressive campaign down to the last hour. But, but do you feel the dynamics have turned against you in the sense that the, here, here's a television lead, the lead the lead gone down like that. Do you feel at the moment that uh, there's a bandwagon effect the other way? Oh no, not at all. Not at all. I mean, if, if you look, these polls vary between one point and eleven points, and if you argue that they're somewhere in between, then by American standards that's still a significant lead. But what I think is that, that as the uh, election gets closer, people are looking for ways to be reassured, and, and, and it is easy for fear to dominate hope, which is why uh, Mr. Bush has spent virtually 100% of his money on negative advertisement, many of them just made up out of whole cloth, but designed to, f the, the message is you should be frightened of Bill Clinton and Al Gore, you should not trust them, things may be lousy, but at least you know me. I mean, that's the whole message there. But, but what about the other factor in the race? Do you think, for instance, if people want change, uh, real change would be to elect Ross Perot, I suppose, I mean, or do you think a vote well, for Ross Perot is a wasted vote? Well, I think that either George Bush or Bill Clinton will win this election. And the people who are for Mr. Pro will have to think that, will consider that. But I also believe I've really given the American people a program for change. There is a, for but example... What's wrong with his, though? Well, well, well why is his even about, better? Well, I think there are reasons why his is even better, but let's talk about whether they're the same, because both of us have come out for very specific and nearly identical uh, restrictions on political action committees, on the cost of congressional campaigns, on the influence of lobbyists over the political process to change the way the government works. And I think that's important. The difference between our two plans is basically that mine brings the deficit down more slowly but creates more jobs in the short run. And therefore he says, he said the other day, um, first of all he said they're moving towards socialism and then uh, later on in the press conference, so a few minutes later, he, uh, he, he withdrew that. He said, well, maybe I went a bit far. But he said they are moving towards, now I must get this right because there were five, five mores. They're moving towards more and more and more and more and more government and the world's experience has been that that has not been effective but that's not accurate I'm, I, what i'm moving toward is different government uh, government that involves more investment and less consumption under the bush plan which was an extension of the reagan plan they favor across the board tax cuts and just hope people with money invest it right under my plan we would do what has worked for america in the past and what works for other countries today give people tax breaks when they invest in private sector jobs. Secondly, I would cut wasteful government spending and invest more money in job creating activities with tax dollars. Uh, thirdly, I would change the way government works. I would empower people to do more things for themselves, moving people from welfare to work, helping the working poor. But so you're Those saying that your intervention is, is not as great. So therefore, do you say a wasted vote, that a vote for Ross Perot is a wasted vote? Well. That is something that each American will have to make up his or her mind about. I don't want to character, I will say this, I believe that Bill Clinton or George Bush are the only two realistic choices for who's going to be elected on Tuesday. And people who want change should vote for me because I have a good economic program. I think it is the best of the three. And because, frankly, uh, my program is the only one that's been endorsed by 10 Nobel Prize winning economists I know, and, and, and keep by John on. White. By Never. John White, who, 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 wrote who the was Perot the author plan. of a lot of the Perot plan. But I mean, do you think, looking at this Ross Perot campaign, do you think it's a wonderful example of the American way that someone can make a fortune and then spend it any way they want? Or do you think there's something marginally un-American about buying your way into an election? I think the people are going to have to make up their mind about that. I, I, look, I need to spend these next four days 
trying to give this election back to the American people, trying to make it about them and their future. Mm -hmm. but I, we're going to win this yeah. thing if they think about what it will be like on the day after the election. So what you're doing actually is what George Bush and you both did at the debate, which is you have to have to go soft on Ross Perot because you both would like his supporters' votes. It's not just a question of going soft. I've been very clear where I disagree with him. I don't mind saying where I disagree with his economic program, why I'm confident that mine's better, and why my background, I think, is better. I'm the only person running. We all talk about change. I'm the only person running who's ever balanced a government budget, who's ever taken on lobbyists, who's never been a part of the Washington insider establishment, and who's ever passed a program through a legislature. I don't mind differing with Ross Perot. I just don't think it's very fruitful for me to characterize him. He had the right to run. He complied with the rules to get on the ballots. And I think he, many of the things he said have been useful. I think calling attention to the debt, calling attention to the wasted spending, calling attention to uh, the need to get a full accounting for the POWs. But, but and I was surprised, in said. our interview uh, on Wednesday, I was surprised. He said his policy was, in terms of tilt, was never once did we mean to tilt towards either party. I thought that if pressed, he had a soft spot for the Democrats, actually, but he was very clear, no tilting in either direction. Does that surprise you? No, because he still wants to get votes. <laughs> I mean, so that, he's being tactful I mean, about both tactful, of you, you sure. mean. I mean, you know, if you, <laughs> I think it's obvious from everything you said that he would be really sorry if Mr. Bush got four more years, given the deep distrust that is between them on personal and political grounds but he's trying to get votes for himself so you would expect him to do that okay. back in may and i fondly remembered interview in may and um on the marijuana issue when it came up you said very engagingly you said i was dumb as a post the way i handled that uh, would you use the same phrase um, to describe your handling of this apparent seemingly endless reporter-led revelations about Vietnam and the draft. Mm -hmm. But you've handled that equally no. the same way? No, I wouldn't say dumb as a post, but there's a difference of issue there. That marijuana thing was just a dumb deal, what yeah. I said. On this issue, there's a different. I, I don't think I answered the questions as well as I might have, but I think what happened was that uh, I had been in public life from 1974 five years after the ROTC deferment was issued and given up and I went back into the lottery. Uh, through 1992 when I began this campaign, or late 1991 when I began this campaign for president. During all that time, when I was right there and all the principals were still alive and everybody who knew all, everything that happened was there, uh, no one ever said I did anything wrong and when asked, people said that I did not do anything wrong. So one of the things that I did not do when all this happened was to have already gathered all any notes I could find, any letters I could find, call people and refresh my memory, so that I literally, you know, didn't do a very good job of answering some of the questions. But the fundamental facts are still clear and still undisputed. But I think that what happened was we had this running series of questions, and I was asked to recall with great precision what happened 23 years ago with um, oftentimes no memory supports. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't answer them all as well as I should have. Yeah, there was a sympathetic analysis of this. Uh, I don't know whether you read it. Charles Peters in the Washington Monthly, he said, I think most fair-minded people have been willing to forgive Bill Clinton for trying to avoid military service in Vietnam. My guess is that he hasn't been willing to forgive himself. I think that's why questions about his draft history continue uh, to trip him up long after he should have learned the danger of answering them in a misleading way. In other words, he was saying that rather as he felt when, when he was in fact uh, invalided out of the war, that, that deep, there's a deep-seated, albeit maybe irrational, guilt there somewhere that gets in the way of your answers. Not no. guilt, not necessarily well-founded, you know, criminal guilt, not talking about that, it's a psychological sense of guilt. I mean, he, he said there were three reasons. One was having the knowledge that an underprivileged boy might have been sent in your place. Uh, a less rational one that uh, you'd evaded a test of manhood and the third one uh, which made more sense to him he said was in fact the sense that um, it's extremely important to men like Bill Clinton who have aspired to leadership positions since their grade school days that war tests how a young leader like with Kennedy will perform in the clutch I mean that was what that was roughly what he said well I you know I think he overdid it a little bit but I do think there was some uh, part of me 
that always I grew up in Arkansas I mean I, I grew up with a legacy of World War II I grew up with the memory of a dead father who fought in World War II um, in a state that was very pro-military and I always had very strong positive feelings myself about military service so that finding myself knowing what I thought I knew and I still believe I did know about the war and feeling the way I did about it was a very difficult thing it was not an easy thing uh, and then when all these questions began to be asked and people who had previously said, I did not do anything wrong, the same people said, oh, yes, he did, and here's what it is, and then people asked me questions that I couldn't remember all the answers to. I think I did try too many times to answer questions off the top of my head when I would have been far better by saying, I do not have an exact memory about that. I will try to figure out what happened, and if I don't know, I just can't tell you. But is there a sort of... Κόπτουμε την συνέντευξη του Μπιλ Κλίντον για να γυρίσουμε αμέσω στο CBS και ο λόγο στου μεταφραστέ μα. 175 κλεκτόρε για τον κύριο Κλίντον, 28 για τον κύριο Μπούρσα. Τα λευκά τα λευκά χρώματα δείχνουν τι πολιτείε όπου οι κάλπε έχουν κλείσει. Και βέβαια δεν έχουμε τα αποτελέσματα από τη Φλόριντα και το Τέξα. Και αν ο κύριο Μπούρ δεν πάρει αυτέ τι πολιτείε, δεν έχει καμία πιθανότητα να εκλεγεί. Βέβαια οι κάλπε στι δυτικέ πολιτείε είναι ακόμα ανοιχτέ. Γι' αυτό προτρέπει και ο μιλητή του το εκλογικό σώμα να πάει να ψηφίσει. Οι ψήφοι μετράνε. Πάμε στην κυρία Τσάνκ. Έχουμε δύο νικητέ όσον αφορά του κυβερνήτε των πολιτιών στο Delaware. Ο νικητή είναι ο Κάρπετ των Δημοκρατικών. Στο Μιζούρι. Ο δημοκρατικός Κάρναχαν με 67%. Και εδώ ένα κύριο θέμα ε, εκλογικό όσον αφορά την έδρα του κυβερνήτη ήταν το, ε, ήταν το θέμα των αμβλώσεων. Και στο Μιζούρι βλέπουμε ότι αυτοί που υποστήριζαν ότι είναι νόμιμο σε όλες τις περιπτώσεις να υπάρξει αμβλώση 29%, στις περισσότερες περιπτώσεις 31% και αυτοί που θεωρούσαν παράνομο, να θεωρηθεί παράνομη ε, η αμβλώση είναι το 35%. Και βλέπουμε ότι υπήρχε μία ένα ρεύμα για τους δημοκρατικούς σε αυτή την πολιτεία του Μεζούρι και οπωσδήποτε ήταν το πεδίο μάχης όσον αφορά το θέμα των αυλώσεων σε όλη την επικράτεια των κυβερνητών όσον αφορά την εκλογή των κυβερνητών. Στη Νέα Ιερσέ και στην περιοχή στο DC υπήρχε το θέμα της ποινής του θανάτου, στρατικής ποινής. Η κυρία Τσάνγκ λέει ότι εκτός από αυτό το θέμα της θανάτικης ποινής υπάρχει, υπάρχει και η, το θέμα της, του περιορισμού της δυνατότητας των πολιτικών να συμμετέχουν στις εκλογές. Δηλαδή ο περιορισμός του χρονικού διαστήματος που θα υπηρετήσουν είτε στο Κογκρέσο είτε σαν κυβερνήτες. Λοιπόν, έκλεισαν στο Τέξας οι πάμε πίσω στις εκλογές μας. Βλέπουμε ότι υπό μικρή διαφορά 42% με 40% η... αν δεν κερδίσει το Τέξας ο Μπούς έχει πάρα πολύ μικρές δεν υπά... έχει καμία πιθανότητα να κερδίσει τις εκλογές και ο Περό ίσως να είναι ένα στοιχείο που επιδεινώνει την κατάσταση όσον αφορά τις ψήφους που πηγαίνουν στον κύριο Μπούς και ε, υπάρχουν κάποιες συνεντεύξεις με τον κόσμο με το κλογικό σώμα στο Τέξας το Τέξας και Φλόριντα είναι ουσιαστική σημασία για τον κύριο Μπούς. Πάμε στον κύριο Γουόλας και θα μιλήσουμε για τη συμμετοχή του εκλογικού σώματος. Είναι ξεκάθαρο ότι ανέβηκε η συμμετοχή του κόσμου στις εκλογές. Πόσο ανέβηκε δεν θα το ξέρουμε ακριβώς ε, για την επόμενη μία-μία μισή ώρα, αλλά σίγουρα έχει ανέβει. 
Το θέμα είναι γιατί. Γιατί ανέβηκε η συμμετοχή του κόσμου. Προσωπικά πιστεύω για τον εξή λόγο. Πρώτα απ' όλα, τα μέσα μαζική ενημέρωση, ραδιόφωνο και τηλεόραση προέβαλαν αυτήν την εκλογική αναμέτρηση. Και έτσι λοιπόν ξεσήκωσαν αυτέ οι εκπομπέ στο ραδιόφωνο και στην τηλεόραση για να συμμετάσχουν σε, σε αυτέ τι εκλογέ. Ύστερα, ο Ρος Περό, πολλοί συμμετείχαν στο, στην εκλογική καμπάνια του κ. Περό και αυτό φυσικά έδωσε ένα αιρέσμα για μεγάλη τη συμμετοχή. Προεδρικές εκλογές στις Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες είναι η ώρα κοντεύει 4, παρακολουθείτε το πρώτο κανάλι της ελληνικής τηλεόρασης σε μία από τις μεγάλες του στιγμές. Έχουμε τώρα στο ακουστικό μας την Γκέλη Βούρβουλη για να μας πει τι γίνεται στο Little Rock. Γκέλη. Το Little Rock πανηγυρίζει όπως είπαμε και την προηγούμενη φορά. Ο Bill Clinton είναι σίγουρος πλέον νικητής. Έχει για την ώρα 165 εκλέκτορες. Έναντι 20 μόλι του πρόεδρου Μπού έχει κερδίσει τι 17 από τι 52 πολιτείε και τι 2 από τι 6 μεγαλύτερε. Οπότε εδώ τι να σα περιγράψω, αρκεί να σα πω ότι είμαστε αποκλεισμένοι στο κέντρο τύπου από το πλήθο που έχει δει στου δρόμου και χορεύει, τραγουδάει, υπάρχουν μπάντε που παίζουν μουσική παντού και περιμένουν τον Μπιλ Κλίντον να βγει και να μιλήσει. Πότε το περιμένουν αυτό, πότε θα, προσπα... θα μπορέσουν να το κάνουν αυτό το πράγμα. Η ώρα που μα έχουν πει είναι 10 η ώρα εδώ δική μα, δηλαδή σε 2 ώρε από τώρα. Πιθανόν να βγει και νωρίτερα, μια και τα αποτελέσματα πλέον είναι ξεκάθαρα. Ο κόσμο πανηγυρίζει, όπω είπε και εσύ, Γκέλη Βούρβουλη. Είναι όμω σίγουρο ότι θα βγει ο Μπού, ο Μπιλ Κλίντον. Ναι, είναι σίγουρο. Δεν υπάρχει πλέον καμία αμφιβολία. Ο πρόεδρο Μπού έχει καταφέρει να κερδίσει μόνο τρει πολιτείε. Την Ινδιάνα, την Νότιο Καρολίνα, η οποία Νότιο Καρολίνα έχει μόνο δύο φορέ τα τελευταία 25 χρόνια ψηφίσει υπέρ δημοκρατικού υποψηφίου. Και την Οκλαχώμα. Μήπω προβλέπετε τελευταία. κάποια ε, τηλεφωνική ε, επικοινωνία ανάμεσα στου δύο μεγάλου μονομάχου, δηλαδή στον Μπιλ Κλίντον και στον Τζορτζ Μπούς. Δεν νομίζω. Τουλάχιστον όχι απόψε. Γιατί έχω την εντύπωση πω θα είχε πάρα πολύ ε, μεγάλο ενδιαφέρον μετά από τα όσα αντάλλαξαν ε, στη, ε, στη διάρκεια τη προεκλογική ε, περίοδου. Να δούμε τώρα τι θα πει ο ένα στον άλλον. Ε, θα έχει πράγματι μεγάλο ενδιαφέρον, αλλά δεν νομίζω ότι θα γίνει αυτό τουλάχιστον για απόψε. Ε, μήπως γνωρίσουμε πού βρίσκεται ο Νταν Κουέιλ. Ο Νταν Κουέιλ είναι στη, στο σπίτι του. Και ο Αλ Γκορ είναι και αυτός κοντά σας. Ο Αλ Γκορ είναι στο Τενεσί, στην πατρίδα του, την οποία βεβαίω κέρδισε ο Κλίντον, την πολιτεία του Τενεσί. Είναι μία από τις 17 που έχει κερδίσει ήδη. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ την Γκέλη Βούρβουλη που είναι πάντα κοντά μας και ξενυχτάει και αυτή μαζί μας στο Little Rock. Εμείς τώρα θα συνεχίσουμε με την συνέντευξη που έχουμε αποκλειστικά για τον, για τον Bill Clinton. Προφανώς έχουμε κάνει Διάνα διότι παρουσιάζουμε τη συνέντευξη του προφανώς του μελλοντικού πρόεδρου των ΟΠΑ. Perhaps inchoate uh, guilt or regret that, in fact, you didn't go. That somehow I regret that the whole thing happened. I regret that it occurred and that I felt the way I did about it. And I wish it hadn't happened in my life or anybody else's. But I can't. It's over. I can't rewrite it. The only day I can affect is what happens today and tomorrow. I have no control over that. And one of the things that I think this whole experience has done for me is to really free me up from it. You know, I, I have received from Vietnam veterans a Purple Heart, oh, a Vietnam yes, battle medal, a Bronze Star from people who said, I believe in you, it's time to put this behind us. At every rally there are Vietnam veterans there was here in Pittsburgh today who said, I, I fought there. A guy came up to me today and said, I did two tours and I'm for you. So are you, are you, in that case, are you proud of your opposition to the Vietnam War? Well, I'm proud that I did what I thought was right. Uh, as all the people who knew me then have commented, you know, I was not, uh, I was hardly a well-known protester. I was a person who just felt it was wrong and said so and felt very strong feelings about it. Um, 
but mostly I'm proud of the fact that I've lived a very good and useful life since then. I've made real contributions and my ideas now will be more valuable for the Vietnam veterans in four more years of bush and quail. That's what I believe. I think, and that's what these veterans say to me. I mean, I have been really moved by the support of rank and file Vietnam veterans, Medal of Honor winners, all kinds of service people. And as you know, the, the endorsement recently of 24 retired generals and admirals, including one of President Bush's chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Deputy Commander-in-Chief of Operation Desert Storm. So I, I have got these people supporting me because they believe that I have sound values, sound views, and a good plan for the future. And I'm trying to make sure that the American people focus on that. Now, I have answered the draft question over and over again, and I must say, my answers are uh, far more coherent, consistent, and apparently accurate than what Mr. Bush has said about arms for hostages or well, the rock gate or all the that reason, sort of stuff. The reason I wanted to take the overall issue and not go through all those details again is that we we did that quite fully, you know, yeah, we did. back in May, and I was coming, that's why I wanted to talk about the overall principle. Indeed, um, it is a reasonable debating point, isn't it? I mean, what do you feel? Do you think actually there is a qualitative difference between protesting in Washington and protesting in a foreign country? Is that a, is that a, a fair debatable point? I don't think there's much of a difference between what we did. We, the Americans, in a church, in a teach-in at a university, uh, at the American Embassy. There was no sense that any of us were trying to be disloyal to our country. We loved our country. We were trying to change a policy. We were, we thought we were doing what we could in a very peaceful and totally law-abiding way to save lives and to strengthen our country. And, you know, I don't want to go back and argue it, but I think Vietnam paralyzed us in a lot of ways for a long time after it was over. It made us uh, for too long unwilling to be robust in the assertion of our values and our interests around the world. And and called into question too many things. I mean, I really believe if I win this race with the support of as many Vietnam veterans as I've had and the support of the military leadership who have overcome whatever feelings they might have to say this guy's got the best plan for the future and has the skills and the character and the strength to lead, I think it really will put an end to the Vietnam War. I think that, that if we win on Tuesday, finally, the war that Mr. Bush said, quote, cleaves us still, will be in our past. Yeah, Ross Perot, in our interview, uh, confirmed Admiral Stockdale's view that he thought the protesters prolonged the war. But you don't think that? No, I don't. And I have very strong feelings about it. I don't think that because we were backing a side which itself could not win after we pulled out in 1975 the South Vietnamese government, which at that time had about the fourth biggest army in the world, lasted 10 days or something. I just don't think so. I think that that had it gone on, uh, had there been no objection to it, it would have gone on longer, but the options we had for winning were no better. And you don't think that it prolonged it because, as he said something about, you know, dissent gives encouragement to people overseas. I mean, no. do you think it actually shortened it? Absolutely. I mean, I think the, the suggestion that if we'd had no dissenters, that the other side would have rolled over is just wrong. I think what, for, but let me say something else. It, the other lesson of this law at war is if you're going to draft people and put them into combat, you should sell the conflict to the American people. You should get Congress to declare war so there can be no doubt about what the objective is. And there ought to be clear and achievable objectives that you then put everything you've got behind achieving. And none of those things happened in Vietnam. One of the things that, that it prepared me to do, and I think the people who served in our generation, people like Senator John Kerry and Senator Bob Kerry, I think all of us are determined to, to see that something like that does not happen again. Here, here, God. Um, what do you look at more closely every morning? The poll numbers or the long-term interest rates? The long-term interest rates concern me. You know, right now, four days before the election, obviously I'm interested in the polls. I want to know where the people are. I mean, you know, that. who are we kidding? I mean, that's important. <laughs> but I have... Um, I really worked hard to try to send a clear signal to the markets that I will be a president who will operate with discipline and real appreciation for the dependence of the United States on the rest of the world and the importance of having a serious economic program that promotes growth and reduces the deficit uh, because we need stable markets and low interest rates. We need that to recover. 
but we also have to end the credit crunch and we've got to get investment back in the economy. I have done what I could in conversations with uh, market leaders in New York and uh, with others uh, in a position to influence how people who operate those markets or influence those markets think to send them a signal that, you know, you don't have to go haywire if a Democrat wins. I mean, even when Jack Kennedy won, and he had a very good economic performance, there was nervousness in the markets, you know. They don't have to worry about that. I have been a job creator, not a job destroyer. I believe in free enterprise. I believe in market economics. I believe in a different kind of government that regulates less and gives people more choices and imposes more responsibility. Yeah, well, people say a bit like uh, Nixon and uh, China, that uh, it's only a Democrat who could really take a machete to uh, to the entitlements and so on. Well, I don't think it's just the entitlements. I think that, the, let me just say, that the strategy that has been followed in Washington has been to cut Medicare in an attempt to control health care costs. So that now elderly people in America pay a bigger percentage of their income for health care than they did before Medicare came in. And what happens is it, it, we, we have refused to learn the lessons of all the European countries uh, and the lesson of Hawaii in our own country, which is that you have to have a system which holds down costs paid for by private dollars as well as public dollars or you can't control health care costs. If you just whittle away at Medicare, you can't. But I do believe the general point is right. I would have a much better chance than a Republican president or than Mr. Perot would to get Congress to restrain spending, to give me a line item veto, to reform the whole structure of a lot of federal programs, to get control of this deficit. I think I would have a much better chance because, for one thing, I run on a program of doing that, on being a different kind of Democrat. For another thing, uh, they would have no one to blame. In other words, the President and the Congress have presided over a doubling of the debt in four years, and they've been able to point the finger at one another. Most people think Congress is the big spender, but in fact, Mr. Bush asked them to spend a little more money than they spent. Yeah. So if I were President, they would have to work with me, and I would have to work with them because we couldn't blame each other. We'd have to take responsibility. And it's consistent with my work. Uh, Let me ask you one thing. I don't want to go through the whole no. economic thing, but there's a point that I made when I was talking to President Bush on Monday that, that lots of people think that neither of your sums add up, that they're both too optimistic. And uh, will you just give me the kernel, rather than going through the whole list, which I know you've done a million times, but take Rich, Rich Thomas of Newsweek. Even on his own mathematics, Clinton gets virtually all of his claim deficit reduction by assuming that his borrow, tax and spend will prove to be a veritable elixir, whipping the moribund economy into an instant gallop that pr provides, that produces huge increases in taxable incomes and profits. Presto, he could have said, hey, presto, I suppose. Federal in revenues soar, producing fully nine-tenths of Clinton's own claimed reduction in the budget. Nine tenths. No. Is he wrong? Yeah. And if so, why? Well, for one thing, he doesn't point out that the tax revenues we propose to raise uh, includes uh, revenues that two thirds of which will finance tax cuts and incentives to promote economic growth. So we're not adding that much in tax revenues. Secondly, there's $140 billion in spending cuts in that program, with uh, I think a lot more potential cuts out there. And uh, thirdly, there are a lot of people who just don't agree with him. I mean, Time Magazine had an independent panel of economists evaluate our three plans. They said mine had the best chance to promote yeah, jobs and growth. Yeah, but, 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 no, well, you've given your answer there, but, I mean, to be fair, you, that panel did say, did say that, but Washington Post and the New York Times, when they do their analysis, they tend, analyses, they, they tend to say, on the one hand, this is why this program, the Bush program, is too optimistic, and then they say it roughly equally strongly with you. I mean, that will only be, obviously, well, let me tell you, that the, will only the, be proven uh, whoever wins. But the revenue estimates we adopted were not, uh, were the modest growth scenario that we got out of uh, looking at the Congressional Budget Office and out of the, what the Bush administration's recommendations were. Uh, I think that these, these, uh, re these things will materialize if we can get growth. But let me say this, if we don't, I'm prepared to cut more. The point I was just going to make is you can't control health care costs simply by cutting Medicare. That, that's a different cost. Are there other things we can cut in the government? Of course there well, are. And you said very clearly that you won't have any 
uh, extra taxes for the middle classes. If the revenues are not... Not to pay for these programs. No. If, if the revenues are not what you've predicted or expected, that then you will either phase them in more slowly or, or make cut more, more spending cuts. elsewhere. Absolutely. So the more cuts would be, what, something like defense? No, well, I, I don't think we can commit today to cut more out of defense than I have already recommended until we know more about where we're going. But I think there are, there are water projects, for example, that are non-competitive, uh, that are awarded on political bases that, that don't have to be funded. There are highway demonstration projects. Not all of them have to be funded. There are uh, all kinds of commissions that serve no useful purpose that can be defunded. Uh, there are billions of dollars in other cuts out there we could make that wouldn't hurt real people in their lives. All right, as we come uh, towards the end of our time, alas, um, do you feel at this point, James Carville gave a memorable quote in the last few hours, I think. He said, you're one of your key advisors, he said, I'm not nervous. It's more like a gripping fear. Uh, how do you feel as, as it gets closer and closer? Do you feel a little extra pressure, a little extra nerves? Sure you do. You always wonder whether you could have done something else, should have done it in some different way, uh, whether there's something else that could be done. But in the end, I think that it is a very clear choice. And I just have to make sure the American people understand what my side of the choice is, that I represent a new approach, a different approach, and that they're going to have to imagine what their lives will be like after the election if we have a continuation of the Bush government and the trickle-down approach or if we try this new approach. I recognize it takes more courage to change than to stay put, but we've tried this other thing for 12 years now, and it's time to try something new. I asked Ross Perot this, uh, what would the first line of your inaugural be? Something like this. Uh, my fellow Americans, we meet at a time of great challenge, a time full of enormously complicated problems and wonderful opportunities. A time of change which no person in public life can repeal. No, that's more than the first line. I see exactly what you mean. And the tone you struck was slight contrast with the, the man from Dallas. The first line of his inaugural was, you're the boss, I'm Ross. So that was a rather different uh, tone. Thank you very much. Thank I enjoyed you. this conversation enormously. Thank you, David. Thanks a lot. Αμερικανικές εκλογές κυρίες και κύριοι, προεδρικές εκλογές στις Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες και, και πάμε αμέσως στο CBS και στους μεταφραστές μας. 238 οι έδρες, 238 οι εκλέκτορες για τον κύριο Κλίντον αυτή τη στιγμή, ο οποίος έχει πάρει και τους 33 εκλέκτορες της Νέας Υόρκης και μια σειρά άλλων πολιτείων. Η μόνη λύση για να κερδίσει... Ο κύριος Μπούς είναι εάν μπορέσει να πάρει και το Χάιο και το Τέξας και τη Φλόριντα, ιδιαίτερα το Τέξας όπου τα πράγματα παρουσιάζονται ιδιαίτερα δύσκολα με 41% αυτή τη στιγμή και οι δύο υποψήφοι. Αυτή τη στιγμή 2.38 ο κύριος Μπιλ Κλίντον, 33 μόνο ο κύριος Τζόρτς Μπούς. Ιδιαίτερα ενδιαφέρουσε οι εκλογέ και των γερουσιαστών. Φαίνεται ότι έχουμε φτάσει την κρίσιμη ώρα. Ξέρουμε ότι πολλοί από εσά δεν έχουν ψηφίσει ακόμη. Ξέρουμε ότι ακόμη δεν έχουν κλείσει οι κάλπε στι δυτικέ πολιτείε. Ξέρουμε ότι πολλοί πιστεύουν ότι όλοι οι πολιτικοί είναι το ίδιο. Οι κάλπες έχουν κλείσει στα τρία τέτα των πολιτιών. Φαίνεται ότι ήταν μια πολύ καλή βραδιά για τους Clinton Gore. Φαίνεται ότι παίρνει τις διαστάσεις χιονοστιβάδας αυτή η εκλογή. Βλέπετε το χάρτη. 270 εκλέκτορες χρειάζονται για να εκλέξουν τον πρόεδρο. 2.38 για τον Bill Clinton. 33 για τον Bush. Ο Τζορτζ Μπούς, πρόεδρος των ΗΠΑ, νυχητής σε πόλεμος των οποίων είχαν εμπλακεί. Οι ένοπλες δυνάμεις των ΗΠΑ χάνει σε εκλογές οι οποίες παίρνουν τη μορφή χιονοστιβάδας υπέρ του Μπίλ Χέντον. 
George Bush has absolutely positively, oh, Scanton, que dice que...